Hello, and welcome to Euphobia. For returning phobies, welcome back. And to everyone else, welcome to my virtual house of horrors. As always, feel free to give this video a like and subscribe if you haven't already done that. I'm always taking suggestions for future videos, so if you have any burning desires to see any particular case covered, then please leave a comment below. And now, on to today's case. The love triangle is a classic trope. We've seen it in movies, TV shows, and even the occasional teenage vampire book series. But what happens when these complicated displays of human emotion play out in real life? And when you add burgeoning teenage angst and hormones, the result is almost always messy. Today's case goes beyond the realm of messy and instead is downright deadly. But are we even talking about a love triangle? Or is that just a term plastered onto this case to make it seem more marketable? Let's find out when we dive into the tragic death of Lee Manuel Viloria Paulino. Our story begins in the East Coast town of Lawrence, Massachusetts. With a population of 75,000, the town had a classic New England vibe, complete with former textile mills dotting the Merrimack River. In the fall, the leaves changed over into a gorgeous display of reds and yellows that brought people from all over the world to witness its charm. Lawrence was at one point known as Immigrant City because it had a history of being a haven for Europeans who were trying to get a new start in America. But, as these things tend to happen, tensions grew between this new crop of cheap laborers and the Bay Staters, who, lest we forget, were all immigrants once. Things got so bad that in 1921, strict quotas were passed to prevent new people from settling into the town. This only lasted till the end of World War II, as things began to pick up again in the 60s, with Hispanic immigrants making their way to this supremely white town and dealing with rising racial tensions. But that was just the past, right? Lee Manuel Viloria Paulino's family was originally from the Dominican Republic, but Lee was born in Methuen, Massachusetts. They were a supremely tight-knit community and all lived in a big house together, including his aunts, uncles, and grandmother, with who he was especially close. She would later tell stories about how when he would get home from school every day, he would greet her with a kiss on the cheek and tell her he loved her. In fact, there are many stories of Lee being an exceptionally affectionate person. He was known to be funny, sensitive, and a lover of art, music, poetry, and dreamed of becoming a writer someday. But on November 18th, 2016, when his family members noticed that Lee was not awake and getting ready for school, they knocked on his door, and they found his room to be completely empty. Well, not like empty, empty, but it was particularly disheveled in a way that made them concerned. But what really made them raise their eyebrows was the discovery that while Lee was definitely not in the house, his phone, keys, and wallet were left on his bedside table. The family immediately began to worry, and the next day he was reported missing to the Essex County Police Department. Search parties were organized by the family, and they began to get the word out about Lee. But it seemed like the police weren't doing anything proactive. On top of that, the media was being silent as well, and the family was getting frustrated. It seemed like no one was taking the disappearance seriously. The police had labeled him a runaway, and were treating the case as such. 
but Lee's family knew that he would never run away from them. He was a happy guy with a bright future and loved his family tremendously. This led Lee's mother and other people in town to speculate if Lee was white and from an affluent home, then would the cops step into high gear? If it was their kid, would they have looked would they have wait two weeks to look for him? Was this just old racial tensions against the immigrant community coming to light? But unfortunately, even if the police had sprung into high gear, a disturbing revelation would blow this entire case apart. A few weeks after Lee's disappearance, a man walking his dog down the Merrimack River reported that he noticed something strange in the icy December waters. When he looked closer, he could see that it was in fact a body. It wasn't until investigators arrived to pull the corpse out of the river that they noticed that he was missing both his head and his hands. During a search of the area following the recovery of the body, a state trooper discovered the head floating in a plastic bag with rocks to weigh it down. The body's hands would never be found, even to this day. As I'm sure you've gathered by now, the body would turn out to be Lee's. It would take over 11 hours for the autopsy to be completed, and in the end, it was determined that he had been s***ed upwards of 70 times, most of which had happened while he was still conscious. Once the news broke of the discovery of Lee's body, the town of Lawrence erupted in an uproar of emotions. Visuals were staged across the town in remembrance of the young man and his life cut short. In one instance, some of his poetry was read to the gathering crowd in a tearful celebration of the art he had left behind. And now that the horrible was made public, Lee's case finally began to get coverage in the local media. In addition, the investigation into his disappearance shifted into a investigation and a heinous one at that. Rumors began to circulate that Lee was seen on the night of his murder hanging out around the Merrimack River, and there were even reports that he was not alone. CCTV footage picked up Lee on the night of his disappearance, presumably headed towards the river, and with him was a shadowy figure. The person seen on the CCTV was quickly identified as Matthew Borges, a classmate of Lee's at Lawrence High School. There are conflicting reports of what Matthew was like. Some call him smart and quiet, with a penchant for helping others. That is common sense. I don't believe the fact that he would do that because it's, it's just not him. But other classmates and teachers talked of a dark side to Matthew. He was known to have anger issues and was described as having a dark aura. Matthew was initially questioned following the disappearance of Lee before his body was found. He claimed that the two had in fact hung out on the night he went missing, but said they smoked and then parted ways after. He said that he had only heard of Lee's disappearance when he got to work the next day and was worried for his friend's safety. He even took the police to the spot that they had reportedly smoked by the river, where Lee's body would later be found. But once Lee was discovered in that same river and the CCTV footage came out, investigators started looking into Matthew more seriously. Apparently, Matthew had been dating another student at Lawrence High, named Lilani, for nine months before breaking up shortly before Lee went missing. This sent a spark of jealousy through Matthew, and he began keeping a watchful eye on her. He would get insanely jealous if she even looked at another guy, even though they were broken up. On one occasion, he even confronted her with a list of guys he was paranoid she was sleeping with. 
And this all came to a head in November 2016, when Lilani and Lee were eating lunch together in the cafeteria one day. Matthew saw this and burst into a jealous rage, causing quite the scene that ended with the teacher escorting him away from the lunchroom. It's unknown if Lilani and Lee were pursuing each other romantically, not that it justifies Matthew's actions, but regardless, it seems like Lee was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. And while all of this seems like hearsay about Matthew's motives, as investigators dug deeper, things only began to look worse. It would later come out that Matthew had channeled his jealousy and rage into a plan to get back at Lee. He had organized a group of his friends to go rob Lee's house. The plan was to lure him out of the house and steal his PlayStation, but Matthew took things way further. On the night that the plan was scheduled to go down, Matthew lured him away like he had planned, and the four other boys managed to break into his house, which is surprising considering how many people lived in the home. It wasn't until after the plan was over that one friend started getting creeped out. He began receiving a string of cryptic messages from Matthew, saying that he actually Lee instead. Miraculously enough, the friend shrugged it off because Matthew was known to say really bizarre stuff. But more and more incriminating messages and even audio recordings of Matthew discussing the murder would soon enough emerge. One friend said that a few days before the murder, he had told her that he wanted to someone and cause pain because he didn't like Lonnie talking to other boys. And finally, the big kahuna. Matthew had told a friend the night before that a person's eyes change after they kiss someone and that she should take a good look at his eyes because after tonight, they'll never look the same again. <laughs> a really dumb move, dude. So this friend naturally reported Matthew to the police after Lee's body was found and he was quickly arrested. It's worth noting that there was no physical evidence linking Matthew to the crime, so if he hadn't been such a braggart, maybe he would have gotten away with it. It would take almost three years for Matthew's trial to begin. During this time, he had spent time in a juvenile detention hall and had recently turned 18, which meant he could be tried as an adult. His trial began in April of 2019. Lilani testified about his history of jealousy and making her uncomfortable with his obsessive actions. He became jealous of me and being friends. The friend who received the incriminating texts also testified against Matthew. His defense team said that there was no evidence linking him to the crime and therefore should not be found guilty but the prosecution entered into evidence not only the texts, but also entries from his diary, where he literally said that he wanted to kill Lee, and even drew out a straight-up to-do list for his murder plan. So, in my opinion, that's plenty of evidence. The trial went on for nine days, and, of course, Matthew was found guilty. His defense team tried to argue that he deserved a lighter sentence since he was a minor at the time of the crime. There are no fingerprints, there is no blood, there is no DNA, and there is no motive. But Lee's mother squashed his chances by delivering a powerful and tearful impact report about her family's life since Lee was taken from them. I feel that this criminal deserves to spend his life in carcerity, so at very least, it serves to keep him off the street. He should never have the opportunity to kill again, to rob another person of their life like he did to leave off. In the end, he was given two life sentences, so he had to serve a minimum of 30 years before being given a chance of parole. The state of Massachusetts stepped in to say that it was unacceptable to give a teenager life without a chance of parole. So in some ways, his sentence was made lighter. 
during his sentencing, Matthew stood there, expressionless, with a blank stare. Lee Manuel Viloria Paulino is remembered by his family and friends for his kind heart and penchant for poetic language. In his absence, the world is truly devoid of a bright star, and we must remember him for who he was, not for what happened to him. Lee's body was laid to rest in Barahona, the Dominican Republic, where a small ceremony was held in his honor. And that is the truly upsetting story of the murder and of Lee Manuel Viloria Paulino. These stories are so sad, but it's important to see them for more than just a grabby headline alluding to a love triangle. Because it's more nuanced than that. A young man's life was taken from him, and yet the story was spun in order to become more marketable. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Euphobia. Remember to like and subscribe below, and if there are any cases you want to see me cover in the future, drop a comment. I'm always listening. Have a good night, phobies. Stay safe and take care of each other. It's scary out there. <laughs>